Declaration. The Balfour Declaration was published on the, or was made, uh, was written and given to the cabinet and accepted by the British cabinet on the 2nd of November, 1917. In the Balfour Declaration, uh, Great Britain promised to support establishment of uh, a home, a national home for the Jews in Palestine. And as Jackie said, uh, today the Balfour Declaration is seen by some as the foundation stone of modern Israel and therefore something to be celebrated. It is seen by others uh, as a first step in Arab dispossession and misery and therefore as something to be deplored. Uh, but everybody, everybody has viewed it um, as an inevitable byproduct of a growing Anglo-Zionist intimacy during World War I. And every previous book, to my knowledge, um, about the Declaration celebrates the remarkable campaign led by uh, a Zionist leader in Great Britain, the Russian-born chemist, Chaim Weizmann. Uh, and they celebrate how he taught the principles of his movement, Zionism, to the British political elite. Well, I don't in any way discount Weizmann's extraordinary qualities and talents. He was indeed one in 10 million. Nevertheless, uh, my book emphasizes not the inevitability of Weizmann's triumph, but its contingency. As I came to understand, the Balfour Declaration nearly didn't happen. Moreover, it was not written in stone. Even after its publication, the British Prime Minister, whose name was David Lloyd George, uh, was prepared to finesse the Declaration under certain circumstances, as I will be explaining this evening. <clears throat> so, now let me figure out how this works. There we go. 1914, the Middle East. Palestine was part of the Ottoman Empire, whose uh, capital, of course, was Constantinople. The Ottoman Empire included most of the Middle East, which is to say Mesopotamia, which we now call Iraq, and Syria, uh, including Lebanon and Palestine in those days, the Arabian Peninsula, uh, and Egypt, although Egypt, uh, although ostensibly under Ottoman control, in fact, since 1883, uh, really had been under British control. Now, the Ottoman Empire was ruled by a revolutionary party that had seized power in 1908, and which was called the Committee of Union and Progress. Um, this uh, revolutionary regime had really taken the Sultan of the Ottoman Empire and made, them into the, uh, made him into their puppet. Um, uh, the Sultan, by the way, was also the Caliph of Islam, which is to say the most important figure in the Islamic religion. Now, I want to mention also that in 1914, before World War I began, Great Britain had Middle Eastern interests, significant Middle Eastern interests, because uh, it um, uh, controlled the Suez Canal and depended upon maintaining control of the Suez Canal. The Suez Canal was really Great Britain's economic windpipe. They could never allow another country to jeopardize their control of the canal. Also, France had economic interests in the Middle East, especially in Syria and Lebanon, and also along, you can't see it on the map, but also uh, along the coast of North Africa. Now, in 1914, <clears throat> before the war began, the ruler of the Hejaz, which today would be considered, I guess, the westernmost portion of Saudi Arabia, was called the Grand Sharif Hussein. This man. The Grand Sharif Hussein was a direct descendant of the Prophet Muhammad, and in fact, only direct descendants, and there were two branches of the family, could occupy this position. The Grand Sharif Hussein was an extremely important figure in the Muslim world because the Hejaz uh, included within it the two most holy Islamic cities, Mecca and Medina. And then also, of course, he's an important figure in the Islamic world because uh, of his heritage as a descendant of the Prophet. Now, the Grand Sharif Hussein nurtured ambitions in 1914. Uh, he was already thinking, probably, about establishing uh, himself as the hereditary ruler of an independent country. Certainly, he wanted, at the least, uh, much more autonomy within the Ottoman Empire. He was not the only uh, Arab nationalist in the world in 1914 by any stretch of the imagination. Um, in fact, various groups uh, situated throughout the Middle East were already talking about um, autonomy uh, or uh, possibly even independence. The first Arab Nationalist Congress met in Paris in 1913. That same year, 1913, the Sheriff Hussein sent his son, Abdullah, his second son, but the one he depended upon most at this point, um, to meet with British officials in Egypt. And Abdullah did so. He spoke with the British Consul General, Horatio Kitchener, an extraordinary figure, um, and also with Kitchener's Oriental Secretary, a younger man named Sir Ronald Storrs, this figure. And what did Abdullah want? And the answer is he wanted machine guns. Um, he wanted to know if Britain would support his father in a rebellion against the Ottoman Empire, the Turks. The British turned him down, explaining to him that uh, they wanted to maintain friendly relations with the Ottoman Empire. But then, of course, World War I began. Britain feared, quite correctly, that the Ottoman Empire would side with the Germans. And then what would happen? Well, they feared that uh, British Muslim subjects living in Egypt and in the Sudan, and above all in South Asia, in India, and present-day Pakistan, would heed the call of the Ottoman Sultan, who was also the Caliph, and who would demand that they wage holy war against uh, Turkey's enemies, that they would wage a jihad. And then they recalled their pre-war conversations with Abdullah, and they rethought their position. Perhaps they would support, support a rebellion against the Ottomans, after all. <clears throat> And what they were thinking was that uh, the Grand Sharif Hussein of Mecca and Medina, such an important figure in the Islamic world, would blunt the call for jihad of the caliph in Constantinople. 
In fact, they thought more than that. Um, they tried to figure out how they could win over uh, the Grand Sheriff Hussein, and Kitchener had stores and choir. Um, well, uh, we'll, uh, uh, we will support you if you rebel. Um, would you like to reconsider? And if you do, we could even think about your replacing the Sultan as Caliph of Islam. Thus began a fateful correspondence. It was carried on between uh, emissaries of the British Empire uh, and the Grand Sheriff Hussein. Now, Kitchener, when, he, uh, when the war broke out, happened to be in London, and he was soon appointed uh, Secretary of War. He did not go back to Egypt. He was replaced by this man, Sir Henry McMahon. And McMahon conducted the correspondence with Hussein. This is one of the most infamous correspondences uh, in history. I cho choose this portrait of McMahon because I think just possibly it suggests that he was a complex individual uh, and perhaps not easy in his conscience. Um, but I may be reading too much into the, into the picture. McMahon, at any rate, in these letters to Hussein, promised British support for an independent Arab kingdom of which Hussein would be the leader. What precise form it would take was left unclear. It could be probably some federation of Arab states of which Hussein would be like a, an emperor or sultan, uh, something like that. But what would be the boundaries of this independent Arab entity? Well, here much depends upon the translation of certain English words into Arabic, and then into it uh, much depends upon how Hussein understood those words. And it didn't help matters that Storrs, the man whose picture you just saw, was doing the translations, and Storr, Storrs admits in his memoirs uh, that his understanding of Arabic was, quote, uh, imperfect. Um, <clears throat> anyway, historians have parsed these letters with a fine-tooth comb. Uh, Zionists and supporters of McMahon have concluded that McMahon meant to exclude Palestine from the proposed Arab kingdom, um, but he didn't say so um, unambiguously. Arabs and critics of McMahon have claimed that McMahon included Palestine uh, in the envisioned Arab independent state. I cannot possibly solve this uh, dispute, but what I can do, and what is beyond dispute, uh, is the following. What I can say, uh, and what is indisputable, is the following. McMahon was intentionally vague in those letters. Uh, as he wrote to his former chief, who was called Lord Harding, and who was now a very important official in the Foreign Office, who had been the Viceroy of India, under whom McMahon had served. Here is what McMahon wrote to him, and I'm quoting from a letter. What we have to arrive at now is to tempt the Arab people into the right path, detach them from the enemy, and bring them onto our side. This, on our part, is at present largely a matter of words. And to succeed, we must use persuasive terms and abstain from academic haggling over conditions. Well, McMahon was successful. The letters were convincing. Hussein agreed to launch a rebellion against the common enemy, the Ottoman Empire. And in fact, it commenced in June 1916. Meanwhile, back in London, the British realized that they had better bring their French allies into the picture. And so they deputed an extraordinary individual whose name was Sir Mark Sykes. This man was already an advisor to the government on the Middle East. They deputed him to speak for them, Sir Mark Sykes. The French chose as their representative in the discussions that were about to take place, this man, Francois-Georges Picot. Now, the two men, Sykes and Picot, went into a room somewhere in the Foreign Office and pulled out the maps and pulled out crayons. They assumed that their countries would defeat the Ottoman Empire, and they proceeded to redraw the map of the Middle East in their own interests, or in the interests of Great Britain and France as they understood those interests to be. Very broadly, the French would get control over what today we call Syria, and they colored that blue on the map with their crayons, and the British would gain control of Mesopotamia, and they colored that red on the map. <clears throat> Now, I should possibly explain, in area A and area B, that was where the envisioned independent Arab kingdom would be. Um, but in area A, the independent Arabs would have French advisors whose advice they must accept. And in area B, the same was true uh, for the British. Now, by the way, they also, you'll see there's another color on the map. And that's because um, they recognized that Palestine was different. Palestine was different because Jerusalem is located there. Jerusalem contains uh, holy sites to the three most important religions of the period. And so they colored it brown, and they agreed that um, although actually the French would get part of what today is northern Israel, but as for the rest of it, it would be governed by an international consortium of powers, or condominium of powers, they also called it, and they called it brown. Um, this is simply old-fashioned European imperialism. There's no other description of it. So let's uh, see where we've gotten so far. At British prompting, and with British help, the Grand Sheriff Hussein proceeded with a rebellion against Turkey. He may or may not have thought that Palestine would be part of his new kingdom. He certainly did not know that in any event, uh, the European allies had the boundaries of his future kingdom planned out for him, uh, plus their own roles within it. Now, this was deceitful, um, and certain British officials understood as much, and it drove them crazy. And the most famous example of such a figure is T.E. Lawrence, Lawrence of Arabia, as we all know him. And you see, I chose this depiction because, again, he looks to me troubled. Um, I may read much too much into these depictions, but in any event, here is what he wrote in a letter. Quote, we are getting them, that is to say the Arabs, we are getting them to fight for us on a lie, and I can't stand it. And he was not the only British official to be so troubled. All right, back in London again there was another group that took a profound interest in Palestine, namely the Zionists. Zionists are Jewish nationalists, and the Zionists were saying that Palestine, the homeland of Jews in ancient times, should be its homeland again. It was currently part of the Ottoman Empire. The Ottomans, they realized, would not give it back to them. They had tried and tried and tried. It was impossible. In 1897, an Austrian journalist named Theodor Herzl founded the World Zionist 
Federation. The aim of this group was to persuade the great powers of Europe to bring pressure to bear upon the Ottomans, upon the Turks, on behalf of Zionism. Well, by 1914, the Zionists had not been successful. Um, Zionism had a world presence by then. It had a world organization, in fact, with headquarters in Berlin. In Great Britain, Zionism was weak. Britain in 1914 had a population of close to 45 million. It had a Jewish population of about 300,000. Of those 300,000, 8,000 were Zionists, and they were organized in several competing groups. The fact is that about 292,000 British people, uh, British Jews, uh, thought of the Zionists as impractical visionaries and dreamers. It's not that they were unfriendly. Uh, in fact, uh, events would prove that there was much latent support within the Jewish community for Zionism. But they were too busy earning livings, uh, going about their business, to pay a lot of attention to impractical dreamers as they deemed them. That's the majority. Some Jews in Great Britain objected strongly to Zionism. They argued that Jews share a culture and a belief system, but that they do not constitute a distinct and separate nation. These Jews, anti-Zionist Jews, argued that Jews can practice their beliefs anywhere and that they should assimilate in the countries in which they lived now, 1914, say. They could be Jews in England or in France or in the United States. These people, these anti-Zionist Jews, were called assimilationists because they believed that Jews should assimilate in their countries. Um, they argued that the Zionists who claimed that the true homeland for Jewish people was Palestine were opening up all Jews to the charge of dual allegiance and that this would only encourage anti-Semites. Palestine will become the world's ghetto, one of them said. The leader of the anti-Zionist Jews in England was Lucien Wolf, this man. Now, World War I began. The Zionists in Great Britain were appalled, as was everybody else. But on the other hand, they quickly realized that the war presented a great opportunity to Zionism. If the British won the war, that would mean they had defeated the Ottomans. The Ottomans they considered to be the main obstacle to the realization of their dream for Palestine. What they hoped was that British victory would lead to a British protectorate over Palestine and that the British would then allow massive Jewish immigration into that country. Now, the Zionists in Great Britain who understood this best and quickest uh, and who acted most decisively, hmm. there we go, Chaim Weizmann. Chaim Weizmann was Russian by birth. Uh, he had left Russia and become a chemist. He had earned his degree in Switzerland. He uh, practiced, uh, well, he became a professor at uh, the University of Manchester in England. In 1914, Weizmann was a relatively obscure figure in the uh, British Zionist movement. And no one would have predicted at that point that he would emerge as the leading advocate of Zionism in Great Britain. In fact, this man became not only that, but as I'm sure many of you, probably most of you know, he became the first president of Israel. Why should he have catapulted into the front rank? I see a number of reasons. He was, it turns out, probably uniquely able to charm the British governing elite. He was also uniquely able to teach to them the principles of his movement, Zionism. Moreover, he somehow managed to persuade them something that we know simply was not true, namely that the vast majority of Jews were Zionist. And then there was something else about Weizmann. He was one of a very small number who were able, it's a form of political jujitsu. He could turn anti-Semitic prejudices to his own advantage and to the advantage of his movement. How? Well, many people among the British leadership accepted stereotypes about Jews, that they represented somehow a vast subterranean influence upon the world, uh, that they uh, were important in world finance, um, that they were important in Russia, where it looked as though Bolsheviks would soon take that country out of the war. At Weizmann's subtle prompting, the British governing elite drew what seemed to them to be the logical conclusion. In order to win the war, they needed the support of this powerful, if subterranean, group. In order to get their support, they must win over the Zionists, and to do that, they must offer them Palestine. Hence the Balfour Declaration. This was Weizmann's extraordinary achievement, and it was based on an absolutely colossal bluff, because we all know the Jews did not represent a vast, powerful, subterranean influence, and certainly all Jews were not Zionists. So let's see where we've got to now. Through the McMahon-Hussein correspondence, Great Britain had won Arab support. They had allowed the leader of the Arab rebellion, the Grand Sheriff Hussein, Hussein uh, to believe that Britain would support the establishment of an independent Arab kingdom. Now historians and partisans argue over whether or not the Arabs believed from the outset that Palestine would be part of that kingdom. We can leave that alone. It's indisputable that McMahon was intentionally vague about that and about much else. Simultaneously, Britain was wooing the Zionists and in fact won Zionist support by promising to support the establishment of a home for the Jews in Palestine. And this they did unambiguously in the famous Balfour Declaration. So Jews after November 2, 1917 believed that they would inherit Palestine in one way or another. They had it in writing. The Arabs believed uh, quite likely that Palestine would form part of an independent Arab kingdom that the British supported. But they had only McMahon's intentionally vague letters on this matter. Now, there is yet another dimension to the story, uh, which further complicates it and which constitutes my original contribution. From the moment that Turkey entered the war, there were British people who wanted to arrange a separate peace with the Ottomans. 
Now, understand, the Zionists believed that Turkish control over Palestine was their greatest obstacle. They wanted total victory over Turkey, the institution of a British protectorate there, and then free immigration into Palestine for Jewish people. The Arabs believed right, that they were going to get, that uh, they would have to help defeat the Ottoman Empire, and then that they would have their own independent kingdom. So they too, like the Zionists, were unambiguously, unalterably opposed to Britain negotiating a separate peace during the war with the Ottoman Empire. Who in Great Britain favored the separate peace? Well, there were a small number of British Muslims in the country. They lacked political influence, they lacked connections, but they felt deeply that it was a tragedy for Great Britain, uh, whose empire included 100 million uh, Muslim subjects, to be at war with the greatest Muslim empire, the Ottoman Empire. And so they were in favor of a separate peace. Then there were what I call in the book British Turkophiles. These were British people who believed that their country should return to Britain's traditional policy, one that had been uh, shaped by the great British conservative leader, Benjamin Disraeli, who, by the way, had been born Jewish, although he was baptized um, at age, I think, 12 or something, or 11 or something. Um, anyway, Disraeli's policy had been uh, that Britain should maintain the Ottoman Empire because it would act as a bulwark. It would keep the Russians from ever coming through the Straits of the Dardanelles and down into the Mediterranean Sea, which the British didn't want. So there were uh, British Turkophiles who wanted Great Britain to return to Disraeli's old policy. There were also more liberal British Turkophiles who believed that the Ottoman government, for all its faults and drawbacks, was a more progressive and liberal government and a more suitable ally for Great Britain than Tsarist Russia, which of course was the most tyrannical and backward of all the great powers. So British Muslims, British Turkophiles. The Turkophiles did have some influence. They organized political pressure groups. They recruited important members of parliament from all the major parties uh, and members from both houses, commons and lords. Also men of letters, uh, businessmen who had interests uh, throughout the Ottoman Empire. They formed uh, a not insignificant pressure group called the Anglo-Ottoman Society. And then more important were the so-called Easterners. Now the Easterners were men in the British government. They had come to the conclusion that Britain and France would never defeat Germany on the Western Front. That was a killing field, a charnel house. There was no way to victory uh, by just blasting through the Western Front. And so a back door must be found. Well, that door was located in Turkey. It could either be kicked open or it could be opened by the Turks themselves. Well, they couldn't kick it open. They tried in the famous campaign at Gallipoli. It turned into another charnel house. The man most associated uh, in the early stages of the war with this group of Easterners was none other than Winston Churchill. Uh, and he was um, one of the architects of the ill-fated campaign at Gallipoli, and he paid the political price. Uh, but there were many others. And the Easterners now concluded that they couldn't batter down the door, and so they must find a way to open it uh, by agreement. And so we come. Uh, I, I show you Marmaduke Pickthall, mainly because I love his name. Um, <laughs> I have to say, <laughs> Pickthall does not play a hugely important role. Um, he is the first to try seriously uh, to persuade the British government to open a back door to Turkey. Uh, he was the son of an Anglican vicar, and he converted to Islam. He is famous, actually, for having written the first translation of the Quran into English. He was the author of many novels about life in the Ottoman Empire. Uh, but his effort was stymied by a friend of his, actually, none other than Sir Mark Sykes. Uh, and so uh, Sykes made sure that he was denied a passport to travel to Switzerland to meet with dissident Turks there about maybe a separate peace. The second man who uh, made a concerted effort to persuade the government and the Turks to come together to talk matters over was a businessman who was so obscure that I could not find a photograph of him. His name was J.R. Pilling. Pilling turned out to be totally unreliable, a rogue, irresponsible. He had um, private reasons for wanting a separate peace with Turkey, which was to get rich again. Um, and so we won't spend much time on him either. But now we get to the important men. Henry Morgenthau had been the American ambassador to Turkey. He knew Woodrow Wilson. He had been an important fundraiser for the Democratic Party. Um, he and Wilson talked about getting Turkey out of the war. And Wilson sent Morgenthau on a mission ostensibly to Palestine to check on the condition of Jews in Palestine during the war. But really, Morgenthau was supposed to meet with Turks and talk to them secretly about getting out of the war. And the reason why an American could do this particularly well was because the United States and Turkey were not at war. They had not declared war upon each other. The United States was at war with Germany and Austria and so on, but not with Turkey. Well, Weizmann, back in London, learnt about this expedition. Um, he stormed into the Foreign Office to protest. By now, and we're talking about June 1917, uh, he had entree to the Foreign Office. The Foreign Office calmed him down. It had come to oppose Morgenthau's mission. Why? It had at first been favorable, favorably disposed, but it had to be kept secret. If people learned about it, then they might begin to think that Britain wasn't confident it could win the war. And unfortunately, this mission was not kept secret. It turned out that Morgenthau couldn't keep a secret to save his life, which is why someone like Weizmann could learn about it um, uh, in London, um, and never having spoken with Morgenthau at all. Weizmann said, send me to stop Morgenthau. Morgenthau was going to break his journey at Gibraltar. And the British Foreign Office agreed and sent him to Gibraltar. And there, Weizmann did it. Every historian, every historian uh, writes that this was a bravura performance. And of course it was, it was. Uh, he dominated uh, Henry Morgenthau and he simply persuaded him to turn around and not continue with this mission. And Morgenthau really crept back to the United States with his tail between his legs. And then the Foreign Office sent Weizmann to Paris where the Prime Minister Lloyd George and the Foreign Secretary, none other than Arthur Balfour, were at a meeting with uh, other allied leaders. And Lloyd George and Balfour were fulsome in their praise of Heim Weizmann. However, simultaneously, the Foreign Office was arranging for an extraordinary figure, my new favorite uh, uh, historical figure, Aubrey Herbert, this man, to go to Switzerland and talk to the Turks about a separate peace. Exactly, I mean, within days of having sent Weizmann to Gibraltar, 
to stop Morgenthau talking to the Turks about a separate peace, they sent Aubrey Herbert to Switzerland to talk to the Turks about a separate peace. I should just take a minute to explain to you about Aubrey Herbert. He was the son of the Earl of Carnarvon. He was the half-brother of the man who discovered the tomb of Tutankhamun. He uh, was the model for Sandy Arbuthnot, who is the hero of the great thriller by John Buchan, Green Mantle. This man was the model for that figure. Um, before the war, he explored the Ottoman Empire. He was a great expert, which is why they could send him to talk to Turks. He rode with bandits in Albania. He um, also spent time clearly with more respectable elements in Albania because he was twice offered the Albanian throne, which he wanted to accept, and the Foreign Office would never let him. Now, let me just say again, just as the Foreign Office was dispatching Weizmann to checkmate Morgenthau, they were sending Herbert to discuss the possibility of a separate peace uh, with the Turks. Weizmann never knew about this, and no other historian of the Balfour Declaration has written about it either. So, Herbert headed for Switzerland, and it is like uh, reading about a thriller by John Buchan. I have his diary. Um, he traveled to Switzerland ostensibly to recover from war wounds, really, of course, to meet Turks, which he did in safe houses. Uh, he picked up messages on railway platforms, and he returned from Switzerland to Paris, where Lloyd George and Balfour were at that meeting. The proposals said, basically, that um, a group of dissident Turks were prepared to overthrow the CUP government uh, and to make a separate peace with Great Britain if they received certain guarantees. Lloyd George and Balfour received Aubrey Herbert two days after receiving Weizmann. They had congratulated Weizmann on stopping the separate peace initiative of Morgenthau. Now they congratulated Herbert on starting a separate peace initiative with dissident Turks. Lloyd George, a confirmed Easterner. He could not get the idea of a separate peace out of his head. He didn't know about Marmaduke Pickthall. He understood very early that Pilling was a rogue who could not be trusted. He opposed uh, Loose Lips Morgenthau. Um, and he feared correctly that Herbert was talking only to the term he uses as second raters in Switzerland. And so he chose someone else. He had another instrument for pursuing a separate peace with Turkey. None of the men I've mentioned so far, but rather Basil Zaharoff, who was uh, the most infamous arms dealer of the generation. And some of you may remember the television, uh, the, the English uh, television uh, uh, production, Sidney Riley, Ace of Spies. And in that production, they have a figure who portrays Basil Zaharoff. Now, Zaharoff, early in the war, received word from a former Turkish minister to Greece and Austria, whose name was Abdul Karim, Abdul Karim Bey. Zaharoff knew him, how? Uh, he had bribed him many a time, he writes in his letters, during the pre-war years. And um, now I think to cut short a long, complicated, and absolutely riveting story, for full details of which please read the book, um, <laughs> Abdul Karim and Zaharoff, well, Abdul Karim told Zaharoff that he represented one of the triumvirate of leaders of Turkey, Enver Pasha, Enver, and that Enver was willing to make a deal with the British about a separate peace. Zaharoff got this message to Lloyd George. Lloyd George understood immediately, of course, that Enver Pasha was not a second raider. He was at the very top. And he empowered Zaharoff to meet Abdul Karim in Switzerland to find out what would be Turkey's terms for a separate peace. Now, please understand. The Foreign Office, the War Office, knew about J.R. Pilling. The Foreign Office and the Cabinet knew about Aubrey Herbert. Only Lloyd George and the Chancellor of the Exchequer, who was the conservative leader, Andrew Bonar Law, knew about Zaharoff. And you may ask, why Bonar Law? And the answer is because he was the chancellor and he would be responsible for arranging a multi-million dollar bribe uh, that would go first of all to Abdul Karim and then a huge sum uh, for uh, Enver to bribe the necessary officials um, and then to go with about a dozen other Turkish leaders um, and live happily ever after in New York City. <laughs> Notice, Arthur Balfour, the foreign secretary, the head of the foreign office, did not know about this. So let me try here just to um, explain the layers of intrigue. Number one. Surely the Zionists would have been outraged to learn about the various missions I've just described to you because a separate peace would have allowed Turkey to maintain control of Palestine. They knew about Morgenthau, but they believed that he had been defeated and that the movement for a separate peace with Turkey had been defeated. They were wrong, and the British did not enlighten them. Then obviously the Arabs would likewise have been outraged to learn that the British were secretly negotiating with the Arabs since they were involved in a rebellion against the Arabs at British behest. Uh, against the Ottomans, I beg your pardon. But you understood what I was trying to say. Okay. Three, Aubrey Herbert would have been astonished to learn about Basil Zaharoff. He thought that he was representing the British government in its exploration of a separate peace with Turkey. But of course, Lloyd George, to whom he reported, never said a word. And then again, let me underline, Lloyd George never told Balfour about Zaharoff's mission. This, just as Lloyd George was about to put his name on the famous declaration promising British support uh, for the establishment of a national home for the Jewish people in Palestine. So Lloyd George was willing to double-cross the Zionists, the Arabs, and his own foreign secretary in order to at least explore a separate peace with Turkey. Um, when I realized that this was the case, that the two were at cross purposes, I asked diplomatic historian friends of mine if this was possible. And they said, of course, it happens all the time. So, <laughs> Now, meanwhile, I'm not um, a historian of Turkey and of the Ottoman Empire, but from the British documents, I understand that there was a darker picture of intrigue and betrayal on that side. Aside from Enver, the other great Turkish leader during this period was a man called Talat. At one point, Zaharoff asked Abdul Karim what Enver was planning for Talat, because Talat was not uh, being mentioned in these discussions. And Abdul Karim said, and I quote from the letters that, the, that Zaharoff uh, was writing for Lloyd George, I myself will give him his coffee. In other words, he would poison him. Now, unknown to Abdul Karim, unknown to Enver, 
Talat had simultaneously begun exploring a separate piece, and in fact, he had been behind the overtures to Pickthall, Pilling, and most important of all, to Aubrey Herbert. All right, now, Zaharoff met Abdul Karim several times in Switzerland during the summer and fall of 1917, but the climax came on the 27th of January, 1918. Enver's wife was living out the war on the Swiss, uh, Swiss border, with, uh, maybe Swiss-Austrian border, I'm not sure. In any event, Enver was able to sneak into Switzerland. Zaharoff traveled to Switzerland. He did not meet face-to-face -face with Enver. Rather, Abdul Karim shuttled between the two men. He was, Zaharoff explained to Lloyd George, a human telephone. <laughs> Lloyd George had provided Zaharoff with his negotiating position. For our purposes, the most important part of it includes the following words, and I'm quoting, Palestine will not be annexed or incorporated in the British Empire. Note, this is nearly three months after publication of the Balfour Declaration. Had Enver accepted Zaharoff's offer, no one would think a great deal about the Balfour Declaration today. It would have been sidelined by history. It would be merely another of the many beautiful promises made during the war by politicians of all parties and in all countries to persuade men to go on fighting and dying. And it would count, as I say, about as much as the other promises that we do know were made and which, of course, were later ignored. No annexations and no indemnities, or open covenants openly arrived at, or war to end all wars. However, Enver did not accept. Why did he not accept? Because this is January 1918. Russia has just been defeated and is coming out of the war, and Enver now thought that Turkey and Germany could prevail after all. Let me be clear, though. The main reason why Britain and Turkey never concluded a separate peace is that whenever one party was really and truly interested in it, because it could see no other way to prevail, the other party was not so interested because at that particular moment the war was going well for it. Whenever Britain was willing to zig, Turkey was about to zag. And thus it continued right through to the end of the war. Let me conclude. Too often, historians have deemed the declaration, which bears the name of this man, Arthur Balfour, to have been the inevitable product of Chaim Weizmann's brilliant campaign to educate and win over the British governing elite to the Zionist program. Well, Weizmann conducted a brilliant campaign to win them over. Nevertheless, the Balfour Declaration was the highly contingent result of a tortuous process that might have turned out very, very differently. And that process was characterized as much by deceit and betrayal as by adherence to principles and liberal values. And today, we have only touched the tip of the iceberg so far as deceit and betrayal go. During World War I, then, Britain sowed, that is to say planted, dragon's teeth in the Middle East. Their fruit, suspicion, resentment, recrimination, hatred, and eventually, following the Greek myth about the sowing of dragon's teeth, new soldiers rose up from the ground. And sad to say, tragically, they are rising still. That's the talk. Thank you.